I'm Lisa Senecal. I'm Maya May, and We're Speaking starts now. Hi, everybody. That seemed especially loud today. <laughs> I don't know if it was loud, but it made me pay attention to the signs. And yeah. I was like, you know, we are what democracy looks like. We are the ones that we are waiting for. We're and getting closer. Yes, we're getting closer. And so yeah. today we're talking about progress. Baby steps, little tiny baby steps to progress. Because all, that's what we have to focus on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll take them. Um, and, and we're getting to make those baby steps because uh, as Mitch McConnell likes to remind us when he's the majority leader, elections have consequences. Well, yes, they do. hey, the Democrats have the majority in the Senate now. So elections do have consequences. And today we're going to be talking about the SCOTUS uh, hearings and nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson, um, who... Senator Graham has informed us if the re Republicans controlled the Senate would never have even gotten a hearing. Exactly. And so we are going to hear all about this with our guest tonight, Angela Onwachi Willig, who is the dean of the Boston University School of Law, an expert on everything from critical race theory to family law to the craziness that is going on right now now in America, but I'm, we're keeping this hopeful. We're keeping this incredibly hopeful because the fact that we even get to have this conversation right now means there is progress. And right. so I'm like, you get, we have to grasp onto it because the thing is what we saw during the hearings is that toxic people, and that includes toxic leadership, yeah. they want to make it about them. And so that's what they do. It's like this onslaught of negativity and what feels um, like a loss is actually a win. And so for me, I'm like, it's time to reclaim our win. Like I want to celebrate our wins because that is what gives us the energy to keep moving forward. Right. And it's, it's those wins, the one you're talking about, but also the wins that got us here that we need to remember. We did that. We had the power to do that. Yeah. Biden is the president. We have Warnock and Ossoff because voters came out and worked like hell and showed up at the polls and gave us two Democratic senators from Georgia. So we, we can do this. We can do it again. We've already proved it. We've proved it in Georgia. Yes. So. And now we know the stakes because we're seeing autocracy. Uh, the laboratories of autocracy seem to be expanding. They're like, well, we tested this in Texas and Florida. So let's expand this to Georgia and to Ohio. We're seeing all sorts of crazy autocratic bills that are truly taking away our freedom. But somehow in the name of freedom, it's a little bit insane. Um, and it's it's honestly it's a it's a collapse of ethics and we've seen it uh we're seeing it uh in real time and so it's that time it is time for a view of last week's ethical collapse with the latest edition of last week in the republican party Boo. Father in heaven, we firmly believe that Donald J. Trump is the current and true president of the United States. God said through his servant, Kim Clement, I will raise up the next president. His name will be Donald. We have the bombshell evidence. Russia, if you're listening, you do this or that with her emails or whatever the hell it was. Trump, I know you're watching, and I know the Space Force is watching. So the Google Chrome logo is 666. The elimination of Zuckerberg Drockbach. He's always very well informed. Zuckerberg Drockbach. Fully, completely engaged. Zuckerberg Drockbach. Energetic, articulate, and smart as hell. And then, uh... Here now with more reaction, former counsel to the president, Kellyanne Trump. Take notes, Madam Speaker. I'm about to define what a woman is for you. XX chromosomes, no tally whacker. He may not have the best history in voting and stances on things, but at least he's not having orgies, blowing coke and getting blackmailed. Cocaine fueled orgy expert Roger Stone. They want to make us all poor. They want to make you live in downtown areas and high rise buildings and walk to work or take the subway or 
ride an electric scooter. You know the kid. By the end of 2022, every fully vaccinated person over the age of 30 may have the equivalent of full-blown vaccine-induced immune-suppressed AIDS. Mickey is crying. Sexualizing kindergartners and first graders, they know that would not fly with the public. Man, you got a lot of huevos. Why not just rename the roller coaster, you know, Sex Mountain? Zuckerberg Dropbox. Sex Mountain, the new ride at Disney at the woke. What is happening? Can you imagine waking up right now? Like if you woke up and looked at the Republican Party, like it's like it's it's like a farce of a farce of a farce. It's like absurdism to the next level. And that kind of uh, leadership is the thing that we cannot allow it to happen. Like we have to look at it every single week and go, this is where these people are trying to take us to. It's not funny. It's not a reality show. It's our actual reality. And it doesn't matter at this point what they say because the lunacy of it is so far beyond anything that is even uh, remotely, remotely acceptable that I feel like we just need to like pack it up, say we're done with them. We're done with them. And then just focus on what we need to do, getting people out to vote, registering to vote. We look (laughs) at these clips and in the, in the moment out of context, they seem funny, but we have to look at the, the big picture of what is really happening. They, all of those comments about children being sexualized and Democrats being groomers, anybody who doesn't agree with Republican um, right-wing philosophy is now branded a pedophile. And it's, it provides cover for actual child predators and it dehumanizes their opponents. So we know what happens in cultures when a portion of a culture gets dehumanized. It's incredibly dangerous. We're seeing it play out in Ukraine and it's it's not funny. Um, they know what they're doing. This isn't just a bunch of yahoos who are just saying things and copying one another, there's a goal here. And it's our job to make sure that they do not achieve it. Yeah, absolutely not. And, you know, to when they're trying to say that our, uh, Supre- our new, our soon to be Supreme Court justice is uh, somehow sympathizing with Nazis. I think that was the line uh, oh, yeah, this week. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nazis and pedophiles, like, we know that it's jumped the shark. And luckily, the vast majority of people in the United States do not believe this lunacy. But we do need everybody to be mindful, register to vote, call a friend, make sure they're registered to vote, check your voter registration. Because as Lisa said at the top of the show, elections matter, and they matter now more than ever before so yeah but ride your dreaded electric scooter to the pole <laughs> I was terrified of electric scooters now i wasn't aware that yeah. they were they're pl- proliferating here so we're in right california on, they are just putting us on the yeah. brink of the total collapse of society <laughs> fortunately tonight we have someone who can talk with us about um all of this but in particular what we saw happen with these hearings in the past week and the attacks um, that happened to uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. Our guest tonight is a, one of those people that makes you um, feel like you've been wasting decades. Yeah. Um, like, Her CV is very long and we graduated from Grinnell at the, it's, basically it's tens of pages. <laughs> so many pages. I'm like, what? I'm just writing jokes. Um, um, jokes matter. And, so she is a lawyer, she's a legal expert, she's an expert on critical race theory, but not like the Republican delusional scare tactic, racist fever dream kind. It's 
the actual CRT. And she talks about it because she's the dean of Boston University School of Law, and it's in law schools where that is actually a thing. So we are so honored to have you <laughs> tonight, Dean Angelo Wanchu Willig. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm like, shout out to Grinnell. Um, I just want to say that really quickly. <laughs> bam, bam. Very exciting. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, like we want to keep this super positive. We're really gonna we're gonna start off with like excitement here. What is the impact um, of Americans on seeing a SCOTUS that's beginning to reflect what America actually looks like? Well, I think you know, number one, it's just incredibly important. I think that we'll have additional perspectives that are going to be represented on the court that will reflect the realities of more people living in the United States. That means those realities are more likely to be incorporated in legal doctrine that applies to everyone in the country. I think it's also really important that we begin to change the idea of what a justice looks like. And, you know, and most people, they think of an image of a justice and they think of somebody who looks more like John Roberts as opposed to Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, I'll say it, you know, I'll, I'll say it out loud. Um, <laughs> speak it into being. Speak it into being, yeah, right. So I think, it, I think it's really important that we change that image. Um, and not only for, you know, young black girls, but for everybody. Everybody right. should have their image of what a justice looks like or a judge looks like tested. So it's super, super exciting. Um, it's just important for so many cases that are going to be coming before the court. She will be, I think, be a real consensus builder. She'll be somebody who will, I think, be highly influential as a, as a justice. It's um, not only is she the first Black woman nominated and who is going to be confirmed, um, but she's also the, the first um, federal public defender who's been on the court and and we haven't had um someone who did a lot of defense work since Thurgood Marshall was on the court so it it's been a little while how does that change you were talking about different perspectives being represented how does that change the conversation on the court to have somebody who has done defense work I think it absolutely changes it. I mean, number one, I think we've got we've gone from being a country that says that everybody is presumed innocent until proven guilty. And really, it's it's in many ways we've assumed people who are simply charged with crimes are guilty before they're proven to be guilty. And so I think it's important to have somebody who has that perspective because they represented people, um, um, you know, uh, who were guilty, who were innocent, oh, the, the full range of things. I think it's important for have somebody on the court who understands, you know, the various reasons why people might make a decision to engage in a particular activity. Um, they understand why people might make particular kinds of mistakes. I think it's important to have somebody who understands the different realities of people of color, in particular black and brown people and white people in relation to policing. There's so much Fourth Amendment doctrine that is really, I think, written in a way that assumes away the realities of so many black and brown people from the, the law regarding consensual encounters to cases that basically say that it doesn't matter what the underlying motivation is for police officers when they stop somebody uh, in a traffic stop, right? They could be thinking, I wanna stop them because they're black and using the traffic stop as an excuse. And there's a case called Ren versus the United States that says that's okay, uh, right? There's a case called Florida versus Bostick that says that there's a such thing as a consensual encounter. Um, that a police officer can stop you, ask for your ID, ask for your name, ask for all these things, um, and it's considered to be consensual. It's not a, it's not a, a search or a seizure, um, as long as a person feels free to walk away or end, end, the, end the encounter. And I just don't know any black and brown people who feel comfortable <laughs> ending an encounter with police. You know, that, that has, uh, could be tremendously lethal consequences. Yeah, and... When we talk about these different perspectives, we often think that you know, different perspectives tend to bring conflict, but in that conflict, there is a resolution and problem solving. And so when she, can you talk a little bit about that? Like her being on the court and being able to engage in these conversations. Cause I think some from the, what we're seeing from the right is this idea that she's going to come in and just like bulldoze people with her ideas when that's not what we're seeing. Can you talk about that in, in terms of also like 
working with students because I'd love to know like the mood of the students on campus and and what it means to be able to engage in actual like conflict conversation um, with people of diverse perspectives. Absolutely. I mean, the Supreme Court itself has said that's precisely how we learn, right? In a case called Bruder versus against University of Michigan Law School, they say that diversity is one of the ways in which we learn, being exposed to different perspectives. We learn how to interact with different people when we're exposed to diverse ideas. We learn that people from all the same group aren't all the same. There's so many benefits to diversity and the court itself has said it. Um, uh, and so I think, um, you know, the, it's, 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 uh, and our students, I think, in particular, this generation, Generation Z, really, really cares a lot about diversity. They've grown up more segregated than any other generation, but they care about diversity and the, and the essays they write, in the things they say, in the way they want to learn about class, in the movements that we've seen them engage in, and the kinds of questions that they're raising. Um, it's it's a generation that I think will, will create a lot of change. And Justice Jackson is somebody who is known for being a co consensus builder. Um, when she chaired the, the sentencing commission with somebody, it's a bipartisan commission, no more than four members of a seven, seven person commission could come from one party. Um, you know, 98% of the, of the, of the proposals were, were completely unanimous or were, were, you know, so she was somebody who built consensus around a really difficult issue involving sentencing guidelines and, and how the guidelines that were issued for a sentencing people who were charged with and convicted of, of federal crimes. Uh, and that's a really, that's not an issue that there tends to be bipartisan agreement on. And yet she really led that group to a lot of consensus on really important issues. I think she's going to be um, you know, you saw really when she was speaking the empathy um, that that comes from and just what her being right. Um, you saw how brilliant she was. And I think that she's going to be able to develop the relationships and have the kinds of conversations that allow people to consider perspectives they hadn't previously considered to that to allow people to understand the realities of people's lives they haven't previously considered. Uh, I think she'll be really highly influential. Consensus building is not an easy thing to do these days, especially in the public sphere uh, when the cameras are on. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I mean, the, the, the hearings were, were beautiful at times and horrifying at others. Um, the, the level of disrespect and just mm -hmm. vitriol that came at her at times. And my God, the woman's ability to remain composed um, yeah. and take that incoming um, is astounding. But so much of that is performative. It's, it's done for the cameras. So yeah. how, do we, how do we have meaningful confirmation hearings in the future when the cameras are on and the biggest concern is a bunch of politicians catering, pandering to their bases? Yes, uh, it's, I mean, I think, you know, I think that calling it out is really important. And I think modeling a different kind of behavior is really important. I think it was important that a Senator like Ben Sass called it, I think Ben Sass called it Jack Azary. I think it was important <laughs> uh, to call it out and to say that this is not behavior that I condone. I don't, I might not agree um, with Judge Jackson on many issues, but this, she doesn't deserve to be treated this way. Mm -hmm. Senator Grassley from Iowa was also somebody who called out the behavior and said that he thought it was reprehensible. And so I think that's important for people who are, are in the same party and witnessing the behavior to call it out. And I think it's important for everybody to say, here's what we think is driving it. And it's because I think that most people view themselves as being people who believe in racial equality, who, who want to see us advance in many ways, in particular when it comes to race. And when you call out the racism behind um, so, many, so many of the questions, uh, uh, intersectional racism and, gen and sexism, behind so many of the questions uh, and, and some of the insinuations that were made, I think also it makes more people who have um, the best of intentions want to distance themselves from that, that kind of behavior. She's the most popular nominee in recent history, more popular than, of course, just Justice Barrett, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch, Gors Justice Roberts, you know, and I think that's meaningful. I mean, people saw her be really, you know, you know, 
grace under pressure um, throughout the hearings. And, and they could see the kind of person that she is. They could tell she was brilliant. They could tell that she had the right temperament and, uh, um, and demeanor for sitting on the bench. And it's one of the reasons why I think she's the most popular nominee in recent history. Yeah, to your point, I think it was 70% of Americans polled were in favor or are in favor of confirming Judge Brown Jackson, which uh, feels like progress. And yet there is this disconnect between the leadership. And what, what are the kind of conversations that happen or that need to happen um, amongst leaders so that they remember that there are uh, there are people <laughs> in our country who are following uh, their lead, um, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of country that we want to be. Yeah, I think that I, I think that <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that question. Is what I would say, <laughs> I, I really wish I had the answer to the question. And you you and you might disagree with me, but I I I think I believe that I saw in in a moment in questioning when Josh Howley was questioning. Judge Jackson, that he actually felt a little bit bad about what he was doing. So um, maybe I'm, maybe people are going to disagree with me on that. But I think that um, I think that reminders, um, the, you know, some of the things that that Senator Senator Booker Booker's moment with Judge Jackson, um, Senator Padilla's moment with Judge Jackson. I think those were really amazing moments for a variety of reasons. I think so many of us felt um, good about the ways in which they uplifted her in that moment. But I think it also reminded people that this is a real person uh, who's a human being who is having to undergo these attacks for hours and hours and hours, nearly 20 hours. Um, and, um, and I think that those human moments where you see someone cry, some people have critiqued it, and all right, um, uh, those human moments where you see someone talk about, you know, walking on a campus and feeling isolated, and having somebody see them and say persevere, I mean, you know, those are those are really important reminders. I think for the public to see, we're talking about a person, a highly accomplished person, um, and that person has feelings um, and um, um, and things take a toll on that person as well. I found it really um, surprising that with as racially charged as the country feels right now, that she does have 70% support in that poll, which is incredible to see. But um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a, a famous answer that I think everybody's heard when she was asked, when will there be enough women on the court? And her <laughs> response was, when there are nine. And people were taken aback. The, the person who asked her the question was taken aback. Like, not, nah, you know, how, how could you ever have an all-female court? And it, it actually took pointing out, well, we had an all-white male court for almost the first 200 years of the country, and no one questioned whether or not that was on. Right. Do you think now there, there seems to be this assumption that if you are a person of color or a woman that you can't make decisions that are impartial the way I guess we're supposed to pretend white men have been told. <laughs> They're so impartial. Yeah. <laughs> Always looking out for the minorities and the yeah. people on the margins. Yeah. Absolutely, there is this assumption, right? Because in our society, the normative view, the view that's portrayed as objective is the, is the view of of white middle class heterosexual, you know, able bodied and, and so on, men, right? And so that's viewed. And so if you if you if you're fit in that category, you grow up in our country, you grow up to perceive one particular perspective as being the way that the ideal or the way things should be. And yet, you know, one of the things is that we all have a race, we all have a gender, we all have a, a socioeconomic class, we all have a sexuality, we all have a gender identity, we all have all of those things. And all of those things shape our experiences, which shape the lens through which we see particular facts, shape the ways in which we understand legal doctrine, right? Um, Justice, Justice uh, Constance Baker, Judge, well, Judge Con Con Constance Baker Motley, who shares a birthday with, um, with uh, Justice Jackson, um, um, 
you know, once said when she was asked, she was the first black woman to serve on, the, on a federal court. She was asked to recuse herself from a, a sex discrimination case on the presumption that she would be biased in, in the case. And she and she said, we all have a sex. We all have a, a we all have a race. And I'm not, you know, basically I'm not recusing myself from this case. Right. As if all discrimination law that had been written, case law that had been written by white male judges before her was objective and biased. Right. And so. Um, I think it's really important to remember, right? Um, I think that so often when you're in the dominant group, you can see yourself, you grow up seeing yourself as somebody who doesn't have a race. And, uh, you know, if you're white, for example, and the people of color, the people who have a race, right? And so I think it's important to lay out and make those things um, visible to everyone. I'm so glad you brought up recusal because uh, it brings to mind um, not everybody has a wife who is plotting an insurrection or allegedly. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about it. Clarence Thomas is, we'll say, a parent since, you know, uh, innocent till proven uh, guilty. Um, is, it rec is recusal enough? Like, does SCOTUS have ethical guidelines? Like, what needs to be done to... Uh, kind of, yes, bring faith back to SCOTUS. Yeah, so there are ethical guidelines that apply to all federal judges except for SCOTUS. Um, and, um, and so it's more of an honor code with the Supreme Court justices. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are going to be a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of hearings in the future about, um, uh, and a lot of more scrutiny into any protect particular future cases under which, um, you know, Justice Thomas might have to recuse himself. Um, it's interesting because that was one of the questions people, of course, kept bringing up whether Je Justice Jackson, before she's even appointed, is going to recuse herself from the Harvard uh, affirmative action case. Um, and she says so, and that that's her plan in the hearings. But it was interesting that there was so much uh, focus on that. Um, before she's even appointed, and yet there aren't necessarily the same questions about sitting justices and wh whether and when they should recuse themselves. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure our current SCOTUS is a court that doesn't need some ethical. Um, yeah, they they need they need to have some guardrails <laughs> because I'm not, sure, I'm not sure they're able to do it on their own. Um, but despite all the chaos, we're still here. The country's still thriving. We still do pretty much have three separate branches of government. So what message do you want to leave us with, leave Gen Z with? Um, I love that you brought them up at the beginning of the show. Um, what message to those folks about um, the people who are trying to hold back progress? Um, I, I would say that it's important that those who, who want to protect our democracy, who want to protect um, the way in which our country should run, the structures that, that have uh, made us uh, you know, the strongest nation in the world, should really, um, you know, should really not stay silent, that it's important for them to to be vocal and to continue to work um, to make sure that the United States um, uh, remains the best country um, out there, um, and I would encourage them to fight for their for, fight for their country in and you know in the and and not in the literal war sense, but fight <laughs> fight for their country and fight for its honor and its integrity. Um, um, the the other thing is I would say um, going back to the Judge Jackson hearing and that is, is that. I think um, you know, you know, John, um, um, John Hope Franklin said um, that you know one of the one of the most important things about um, President Obama getting elected was you know to see a black family, right? This having the first family be a black family, and I think one of the really important things that we saw too, although we saw it with Justice Thomas as well, though not it wasn't as visible. Um, was to see um, just, ju ju Justice Jackson's family, right? Uh, a really, again, it's a, another reflection of a changing country that we live in, uh, a multiracial uh, um, family, a couple that met when they were in college at Harvard, uh, you know, dated all throughout college, got married, you know, have two beautiful daughters, you know, it's, it's a reflection of the ways in which we are changing in the United States. And I think having 
um, um, you know, her family also be a, as visible as it was during the hearing was a really important moment for our country. Absolutely. Um, representation truly across the board. And it's inspiring because it does model the fact that we can actually live together in harmony. We can do this. We don't have uh, any other choice. So thank you for um, reminding us of that. Um, truly, um, absolutely love having you here, Angela, as a fellow Grinnellian. Another shout out to Grinnell because that's what we do. I see you representing the Scarlet and black. I don't know if that was intentional, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that it is. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much, um, truly for the work that you're doing and for inspiring students and connecting and truly hearing them and guiding them um, in a way so that our country is moving towards the light as opposed to the darkness. So um, thank you again. And hopefully we will have you back sometime soon. Great. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. I I feel inspired. Maybe it's just because I'm uh, super excited about talking to Grinnellian, but uh, <laughs> but truly, truly, like some of this week, the last couple of weeks have felt very, very tough, very draining, and and hearing in this interview that we are, there's progress and that is, it is coming, change is coming and we're seeing it. And it's just like such a nice reminder. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's yeah. actually what it looks like. That's what resilience in the face of, you know, all of these people who want to try to stop progress. This is what resilience looks like. And it's actually quite graceful um, in many ways. It is. And that, that 70% support that she has is something that I really hang on to because it, it gives us that perspective that we talk about a lot, that there are more of us than there are of them. There are 30% of people who oppose having the first Black woman on the Supreme Court. That means there are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump who support Justice Jackson. That that really matters. And um it it's, confusing. Happy. it's confusing. It's confusing. <laughs> I don't completely understand it, but I'm happy to see maybe some people have had a change of heart. Yeah. I don't know. What whatever caused that 70%, that means there are the numbers out there mm -hmm. for democracy to succeed, for progress to happen. It it is all within our ability to make the good things happen in this country that we want to see happen. We just, at, as Angela said, we have to speak up and we have to be active. Absolutely. And um, that's a perfect time to bring up the Webby Award. Lincoln Project was nominated um, for speaking up and encouraging people to speak up. Um, we're in this social news and politics category for our corporate responsibility campaign. So thank you for your support. Um, you are the best audience in the biz. You already know this, very engaged. Um, and you can vote for us to take home the prize. Go to Webby Awards. Dot com webbyawards.com vote for the lincoln project i don't know what we get if it's like a trophy or some medals or something but uh, we get a pat on the back <laughs> pat yourselves on the back what we're doing, which is great <laughs> yes. um and more attention for it which is really important um speaking of other ways to raise the profile tomorrow night. Once again, The Breakdown with Tara Setmeyer and Rick Wilson. They'll be on at 7 p.m. Eastern for Pacific. Um, we are going to end uh, tonight with, um, I don't want to say it's a down note. It's an important note. Um, we're going to leave you with one of the most powerful ads that the Lincoln Project has ever produced. Um, it was released yesterday. It's so important for us to bear witness to mm -hmm. Russia's atrocities against the Ukrainian people. Truly, and the Republicans who side with Russia have basically aligned themselves with Putin. He's a war criminal. This is autocracy. When we've talked before about the ADL pyramid of hate, like this is where hate leads. Um, so please watch. People are dying on the front lines. You think it's a joke? Why do I care? Why do I why care, do I why care about what's going on in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? We're not an ally of Ukraine. I keep saying ally, ally. We're not. A, you got this minx accord and the stuff kind of bouncing around. They're, we're not an ally. They're not an ally. Why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because which I am. 
about Vladimir Putin, you know, I analogize him to basically an authoritarian gas station attendant. Why does permanent Washington hate him so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Putin ain't woke. He is anti-woke. No, Vladimir Putin didn't do any of that. He's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. I said, how smart is that? In American terms, you would call Ukraine a tyranny. We've never been an ally of Ukraine. That's the strongest peace force I've ever seen. There were more army tanks than I've ever seen. They're going to keep peace all right. What the Russians did was an attack. I don't care. We could use that on our southern border. This is genius. I'm in the city of Bucha, and it's Corso, the capital. What happened here and everywhere in Ukraine, what is happening, this is not special operation. This is not military objects. This is civilians. They've been shot in the head with the tight hands behind their back. This is genocide of the Ukrainian population. And that's exactly what Russian regime, Putin's regime, Russian army is doing, killing the civilians with the tight hands behind their back and with a shot in their heads.